Okay, greetings everybody. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and uh, get started. We know more people are gonna be coming in, uh, but in respect to everyone's time and the amount of depth that we want to get into today, uh, we're gonna go ahead and uh, get started. So I introduce myself, I'm Kali Akuno with the Institute for Social Ecology um, and wanna welcome all of you uh, to the first of a three-part series that we're going to be doing uh, with Max Isle, um, a People's Green New Deal, a critical interrogation of a radical proposal. Uh, this is part of an ongoing series we're going to be doing uh, with the Institute for Social Ecology uh, on uh, racial and environmental justice. Um, the second part of this series will be next Friday, the 22nd of October, and the third and final part will be the 29th of October. And what we're doing, just so folks are, are clear, is going through the book. This is the book, People's Green New Deal, and we're going to be going through it to kind of really uh, break it down um, a couple of chapters at a time uh, uh, in each one of these series. I think that's a critical thing to do because Max has packed a lot in here. Uh, almost each one of the chapters in, in this book could be a book unto itself. <laughs> um, you know, given the subject matter and the things that need to be uh, broken down. So we're gonna give him and all of you, all of us an opportunity uh, to interrogate it a, a bit more further than just what's on the printed page. Uh, and we'll do that uh, through kind of an extensive question and answer section. Um, I will say just so folks know and understand how, you know, this is going to work. Um, if we're under uh, 30 people, and I think more folks are gonna join in, we'll just allow uh, for people raising their, their hand features on, on the Zoom, if everybody's familiar with that. Uh, folks to uh, go in order, uh, we'll do, uh, what's called progressive stack for those of you who are not familiar. This is to make sure uh, that we hear <coughs> from broad constituencies <coughs> in the conversation and make sure there's a whole range of questions representing a whole different range of uh, sectors and interests. So we'll do that. Um, please keep uh, the questions brief uh, and, and direct. Uh, and if there's any kind of major points of, of counter exchange, we want people to include that uh, in the chat feature. So I mentioned earlier, for those of you who are just listening and coming on, we will be using the chat. We'd like for everybody who's here, if you haven't already, uh, to just write your name and where you're from. So we have a good sense of that. Um, and those are gonna be our, our basic format, you know, uh, for today. Uh, and without wasting a lot of time, because I really want to get into it, I'm going to just um, briefly introduce, you know, uh, Max. We go back a, a ways uh, as comrades in work. Um, you know, he authored uh, this book, um, came out earlier this year on Pluto Press. So if you haven't picked it up, definitely encourage everyone to do so. Uh, and it's in direct response. Uh, to the hype, and I'm going to use that word intentionally, to the hype uh, around the Green New Deal, both uh, in North America and Europe, uh, is kind of uh, the main uh, instrument or catalyst for change around climate change uh, being touted primarily by liberal and left forces. And we need to really look at it to interrogate what's within it, because most of the proposals are either so generic as to be uh, co-opted by any and everybody, or uh, they're just new kind of extensions and new packaging of green capitalist deals. Um, so uh, I am happy for one that Max really took this, this challenge uh, head on and produced this work. And uh, what I wanted to do just to, to get us started um, you know, not assuming anyone is familiar with the work or familiar with certain concepts. Uh, so on, during our first session, there's a couple of things I just want Max to kind of break down uh, to give a grounding in brief. Uh, and it's just a few that I think are hinted at within these first 
a couple of chapters. And what we're looking at today for everybody is clear is the introduction in chapters one and two. Um, and so what I really want you to do, Max, just to get started before we get into kind of Q&A, um, the one critical uh, piece that I think becomes central to uh, of any serious conversation uh, around justice within this context is climate debt. Uh, and I know a couple of people have, have kind of raised that a question that uh, wondering what it is and where it came from. So if you can just take a couple of minutes to break that down, Max, then I'll come with, with a couple of others that I just want folks to be very situated in before we, we get through and interrogate the chapters. Yeah, definitely, Kelly. I appreciate uh, the introduction. I appreciate the invitation. Um, and if I may offer a word about the background, because um, it's actually something that's very relevant to this book in general, is uh, behind me is the background of a, a painting of, by the foremost or one of the foremost artists of the ongoing Philippine liberation struggle, Parts Pagani, who was assassinated uh, by the Duterte regime. Um, a, couple, uh, a little, I think about two months ago. Um, and it's this type of agrarian struggle, agrarian national liberation struggle, or a struggle for agrarian reform and sovereign development and industrialization that I think is very central for people, especially those of us in the North, to understand um, as part of the struggle for a better world and uh, understand and uh, build sympathy for. Um, it's also, of course, um, uh, parts Pagani was a supporter of, uh, of a national liberation struggle that's currently on the what's called the US terror lists, which is an instrument to prevent us from understanding, sympathizing or, uh, with these struggles. Uh, so to get, to get to this concept of climate debt, uh, climate debt emerged uh, from, I mean, of course, there, there have been numerous uh, attempts from the global south and uh, subject nations within the imperial core, of course, to demand monetary compensation or non-monetary compensation for the damages inflicted upon them in the course of colonial capitalist, uh, so-called uh, development and uh, industrialization processes. So uh, it's of a piece with those types of, demand, of, of demands. And it emerged from, the, uh, it, uh, it grew out of, uh, what was codified in law in the Rio summit in 1992 as this idea of common, but differentiated responsibility for dealing with the climate crisis. What that meant is that there was uh, taking nation states as the units of analysis because this is international climate com convenings and uh, primarily these are places where nation states are the inter main interlocutors, representatives and avatars of peoples. Um, the, the idea is that uh, each nascent state had a, a common responsibility to do something about the climate issue, whether that was uh, some form of reconstruction of its internal uh, social and productive infrastructural industrial texture. But it was differentiated because nations not only have different capacities, but different levels of responsibility, right? So it's differentiated. Uh, so this meant or was a way of beginning to gesture towards responsibility for the colonial legacy, the ongoing settler colonial present, the neo-colonial present, and the overarching structure of imperialism, which uh, is the wide scope of, uh, of, uh, of power, which contributed to all those processes. So in, uh, of course, so this idea of climate debt, uh, gained strength during the global justice movement throughout the decade of the 2000s. And then in uh, 2009, at the Copenhagen meetings, and some of you may well know much more about this than I do, frankly, um, they tried to ram through an agreement that basically rejected this idea of common and differentiated responsibility, rejected mandatory caps aimed for two degrees, uh, as, the, as the supposed target and so forth. Uh, this was essentially blocked by a uh, radicalized alliance of state forces, uh, Cuba, uh, Bolivia, under uh, Evo Morales, Venezuela, 
under uh, Hugo Chavez and also South, uh, Sudan. And uh, Evo Morales in particular put out a call for an alternative uh, people's convening to take place in the Bolivian city of Cochabamba, which is of, of course the iconic city where the people had won a water war against uh, Berta, against uh, privatiz the privatization of the municipal water system. At that meeting, which actually occurred in April of 2010, with a very wide civil society consensus of groups across the entire Global South and also uh, representatives from the Global North, there was an agreement on uh, what came to be entitled the Cochabamba People's Agreement. The Cochabamba People's Agreement involved a lot of demand. What I always tell people um, whenever I discuss my book, I'm like, of course you can read my book if you wanna understand uh, what, the, what the enemy is up to, because that's uh, a lot of my book is devoted to uh, the maneuverings of the enemy. But if you wanna understand the Global South, what the historic Global South consensus around climate change, you can just go read the Cochabamba People's Agreement on the internet. You can put that into a search engine. You can find it, you can read it for free. You can read my book for free too, uh, but you can print it out. Uh, you can read the annexes. And that is a real education about what uh, demand for global climate justice looks like from the global South, right? Um, and is the state of the art. I have not seen a more sophisticated document that has emerged since that. I was really the foundation stone for what I developed in my book. Now, the most radical demand, in my opinion, that came from the Cochabamba People's Agreement were not only demands for all sorts of sovereign rights, rights to be free of war, rights to food, the rights of Mother Earth, all of these are extremely significant. But in terms of a kind of a clear demand that was a contestation against the world capitalist system, what they demanded was 6% of Northern GNP or OECD, roughly GNP per year, to flow from the North to the South for an indefinite period of time. Now the OECD is basically talking about Western Europe, Japan, um, and the European settler offshoots. In other words, America, uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. 6% of Northern GNP was gonna be the climate debt, the quantity of climate debt that was going to flow in order to help countries to adapt, to mitigate the ongoing damages and to, to compensate them for the cheap development paths that they would not be able to use because they have to use more expensive, energetically speaking, development paths uh, to produce clean energy for their peoples. In quantity, um, and it's also very important to point out that this, this demand for climate debt of 6% of Northern GNP, which is a huge amount, right? Um, that was actually only one, a down payment as they conceived it on what they called the ecological debt, which wasn't part in turn, only a portion of the colonial debt, right? So this is very uh, leaving scope open for further redistribution, right? This is actually a call to materially unsettle the material foundations of the world order. Um, and in terms of quantity, that would be roughly uh, 1.2, 1.3 trillion per year from the US to the South and 3.2 trillion from the whole OECD from the wealthy countries to the South. And of course, 6% is well in excess of annual rates of growth. So uh, although I don't wanna, I, I prefer not to use the language of degrowth, in effect, you would be looking at a controlled shrinkage of uh, Northern GNP, um, which doesn't mean uh, losses in quality of life. So you're looking at a massive resource transfer. And what they did politically was brilliant as well. They actually linked that to a direct shift in the way the US socially and politically allocates its resources, right? What they said is the US can afford to spend a trillion dollars on its military. So who can say that it can afford to spend roughly a trillion dollars on climate debt repayments, right? Uh, that it couldn't spend, that it can spend a trillion dollars a year on killing people, but not on healing people. Okay, that's a political decision, right? It put the political issue forefront and also actually created a basis for convergence of anti-imperialism, anti-militarism, uh, anti uh, conversion to a peacetime economy in the core and uh, world climate justice and uh, dealing with the climate crisis more broadly, right? 
So this is actually um, a brilliant political maneuver, in my opinion. And it is, should really be something that we all need to educate ourselves about um, in the core to, to build into our own local work uh, towards just transition. Another concept I'd like you to, to, to touch on, uh, just to get folks kind of grounded in, um, is this notion of fossil capitalism. Uh, and I think this is a critical one um, particularly in an age where there's, there's all these adjectives that are being used to describe capitalism, racial capitalism, et cetera, some of which I'm quite frankly not that fond of, uh, but you use it um, uh, in the book for some very particular reasons. So if you can just break that down just briefly for us so we can get a grounding in that uh, as we go into the book, I think that would be one of the, the, the criticals. Then I got two more for you before we get into some questions. So fossil capitalism is specifically pointing to when uh, it's, it's not stating that we can reduce uh, the ecological crisis of capitalism merely to fossil fuels, right? Because the ecological crisis of capitalism is more or less inbuilt into capitalism, right? Um, and we can take it back to 1492. But fossil capitalism is telling us that at a certain point in history, the entire uh, capitalist system became extremely reliant on fossil fuels in order to continue its process of endless accumulation and accumulation on a world scale. And this marked a certain qualitative shift in the sense right. that uh, this kind of created a contiguous or a, 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 a way that the whole ecological crisis kind of enveloped the planet because it started putting out this carbon dioxide, which is a poison that are a pollutant that damages everybody on the planet. It doesn't damage everyone equally. We know that very well. But at this point, suddenly the, the accumulation of capital became intimately, although possibly temporarily tied to fossil fuel combustion. And it is this specific object that we at least need to understand if we wanna understand all sorts of other things, including uh, how to imagine and move towards a just transition if we want to understand uh, the demands for climate debt repayments and so forth. The other one, Max, I, I want you to touch on is this notion of the, uh, the great transition, right? Uh, and to really contrast that with the notion of a just transition, some of which uh, are very opportunistically, I would add, and we could talk about that why, are often conflated with each other. Uh, but particularly in chapter one, you know, you, you outline uh, a, a good breakdown of the kind of constituent arguments of, of why the different sectors of, capitalism, uh, uh, of capital uh, and many, uh, even nation states, uh, are articulating this call for a great trans transition. So break that down for us, just that term, you know, kind of how it's being used and what it means. Yeah, definitely. So I think uh, briefly, I might say that it, I think it's a kind of weird uh, pathology of our current moment that although uh, we're encouraged, including by like academics and so forth, to really pay attention to very uh, contradictions within local organizing and so forth. We much more seldom are encouraged to actually look at what the ruling class is doing. That is its plan practices, its outline, its blueprints, its maps for the class war, right? That is not very present in the green, much of the, the chatter about a Green New Deal, right? There's not a lot of discussion. What is the ruling class planning to do? How can we identify it? How can we stymie it? And how can we, in fact, set off, set out an agenda that does not even look anything like that and that actually seeks to actually have a totally different outcome? So the Great Transition is looking at the great variety of blueprints that are coming from the North to carry out a form of transition to a non-fossil fuel dependent uh, economic system. 
say economic system and not necessarily capitalism, because I think we shouldn't get necessarily caught up on capitalism in a sense. We should oppose capitalism. We should also know that the core of what the ruling class wishes to maintain is to be a ruling class, have uneven access, polarized accumulation of wealth, right? It doesn't need it to have that be under a capitalist system of growth. It could be something else too. This is just something to keep in mind, right? Um, now, the great transition is large aspects of their plans to do exactly that. And there's uh, a couple facets of it that I think are increasingly uh, appearing with more and more uniformity in the, uh, the ruling class literature, right? One of them, uh, the continued presence of the military across the North and roaming into the South. Two, aggressive border control, because they're aware uh, that there will be climate refugees no matter what, and they're aware that they do not want to let them in. Increased militarization of borders, increased role for the, accordingly for the national security apparatus in policing those borders, and also what they call, uh, you know, forms of uh, assisting, and this is very opaque, uh, assisting this kind of uh, transition domestically. Uh, five. Uh, demographic engineering or Malthusianism, in other words, controlling the birth rates of people in the third world. Uh, six, uh, shift to a full uh, renewable transition or uh, including uh, what isn't really a renewables, but a nuclear transition. Uh, seven, an emphasis on land sparing industrialized agriculture, or climate smart agriculture, in other words, highly capital intensive agricultural system that seeks to achieve a maximum of production on a minimum amount of land. Uh, fortress conservation or half earth conservation, in other words, uh, attempting with various degrees of what I think cynical recognition of indigenous land rights to concentrate the population of the planet as much as possible into what they call half of the planet in order to preserve biodiversity hot zones. Uh, I forgot what I'm up to, probably nine. Uh, a very technology intense plan for a great transition. Um, the 10 replacement of uh, currently existing fuels with biofuels to the extent possible, which are in direct competition with food crops across the global south. Dietary interventions, which will basically amount to massive interference in third world dietary patterns in order to in turn make them use up less social resources. Um, and very, very importantly, uh, to achieve a renewables transition to the South, that it actually turns the renewables transition into a new frontier of accumulation. And so this is to be achieved through mobilizing uh, third world state capital and using that to kind of crowd in or, or support or act as a buffer or scaffolding for private Northern capitals so that it is not exposed to systemic risks. Another aspect of that is mobilizing uh, the states to actually surrender their sovereignty, essentially through agreements, what are called risk sharing agreements that guarantees them against future expropriation uh, or changing the terms of this renewable installation that will be powered by Northern technology. So in a sense, the entire energy infrastructure of the South will be based, will be uh, the sovereign property of the North and will be a permanent irrevocable revenue stream for Northern, uh, Northern corporations or Northern conglomerates or Northern power, whatever comes next. Those are basically the, what I think are the constituent elements. There's more that could be added, but those are the major ones uh, of the great transition uh, that is being planned by uh, actors like uh, the Breakthrough Institute in the US, um, which you can look into and look into it's about, look into, look into its donations. Uh, Breakthrough Institute in Australia, the World Economic Forum. This is, some of this is linked with the Great Reset Agenda. Uh, some of this is associated with the Eat Lancet Agenda. Some of this is associated with the Climate Finance Leadership Initiative, um, the Stordaland Foundation, Scandinavian Foundation. So again, um, this is, uh, and for this, I, I urge people to just check the first chapter of the book, 
check the footnotes because this is not a conspiracy. This is a, a, a conspiracy theory because the ruling class conspires, but it is exactly what is being planned. Um, and it is directly drawn from the strategy documents of the ruling class that are publicly available documents that anybody can read and check out and confirm for themselves that this is the agenda. And uh, these are the people who are funding it, putting out the propaganda and also putting out specific plans to reflect their interests and uh, guide some tiny portion of humanity into a just future with most of humanity uh, in a barbarous situation. And then the last one of these concepts before we kind of get into uh, a, a question and answer piece. The one I, I was saving for last because I think this is one of the greatest dangers to the left uh, because it creeps into our own thinking in a, in a number of different uh, ways and a number of different proposals, you know, that are coming out, including a Green New Deal. And that's eco-modernism, right? Give us a good breakdown of that one and the dangers that it poses in many respects. Uh, eco-modernism, in a nutshell, is the idea that the fundamental problems of uh, ecological transition are technological, rather than social and distributional. Uh, in other words, that we can fix the bulk of the current problems through changing technology and that this will allow us not only to avoid questions of power within the world, power and powerlessness within the world system and questions of the distribution of wealth in the world system, but that this technology could, through some kind of mystical, conduits actually allow everyone in the world to have prosperity if we just invent enough new stuff. Um, actually, so it's eco-modernism because it goes back to a very old myth, right? This is the myth of modernization as pushed in the 1940s and the 1950s, which was basically that if you inserted the appropriate technology into third world societies, they would be able to achieve equivalent levels of development as the North. And this was a failure then, at least from uh, its announced goals, although it was a victory from the perspective of capital accumulation. And of course, it would be, it will be eco-modernism will likewise be a failure in terms of accomplishing any form of just redistribution of global wealth. So thank you for those breakdowns. Um, you know, I think those four, there's others, but I just wanted to start with those. I think kind of get to the heart of the first, uh, the introduction in the first uh, two chapters. Uh, I'm gonna just leave, perhaps I'm, I'm trying to pick between a couple. I got a whole host of questions y'all, but maybe two, and then we're gonna open it up for all of you. Uh, to ask some direct questions uh, uh, of Max based upon the work and his comments. Um, but I would be remiss for us to not bring up the uh, COP26. Uh, and that's the Conference of Parties, for those of you who don't know, the 26th United Nations Conference of Parties to negotiate around climate change. Uh, this one is going to be in, in uh, Glasgow, in Scotland. Um, and I want to draw folks, just kind of skipping around, but I want to draw folks, if you have the book in front of you or, or for future reference, to page 32. <clears throat> and, you know, there you, you, uh, you talk about the Climate Finance Leadership Initiative, right? Um, and what its objective is, and you, you mentioned it being one of the more cynical, uh, and I would state one of the more honest, uh, uh, conversations and plans like blueprints that are out there uh, being promoted at the highest levels, you know, by the Secretary General, no less. Um, and what I'd like for you to do is, is, well, let me say this, this sets the table, why I'm bringing it up, this sets the table for what COP is really, what it really is and what it's really negotiating, right? Particularly since the, the, the defeat of the social movements from Copenhagen on. And while I think, you know, what the social movements did in Copenhagen in terms of 
bringing the negotiations to a standstill uh, on its head was uh, an accomplishment. Too many of us uh, walked away fearing not having access to the conversations and the discussions and didn't follow that up with a more radical program and then didn't support the radical program that, that did emerge uh, in culture bomb. So we, we were later on gonna talk about this kind of missed opportunity and this gap. Um, but I want you to just give a breakdown of this particular initiative, Max, right? The, the CLFI, for those of you uh, who are looking up in the book, you know, give a breakdown of this in the context of what we can expect from, from COP26, and more importantly, what we could expect from the Biden administration, which I would note, and we can break down, has adopted certain aspects, at least in terms of the conceptual framework uh, of, of this plan, particularly in how it's looking to roll out uh, this, this multi-trillion dollar um, uh, bill that they're trying to usher through uh, uh, Congress, particularly if you look at these, all the things that they're touting is, uh, this is where we deal with climate change by creating the, this uh, uh, new infrastructure uh, of, you know, for electrical vehicles and things of that nature. Uh, it's very much rooted in, not just in this plan, but within this general framework. But if you can break this one down, uh, I think it'll give us some context. And then I want to go more into chapter two for the next question, and then we'll open it up. Yeah, so the Climate Finance Leadership Initiative was, uh, was is an initiative with Goldman Sachs, uh, Bloomberg, uh, Macquarie, uh, just major imperial core uh, financial institutions, um, and was, was tasked by, uh, I think, Antonio Gutierrez, the, mm -hmm. the UN, uh, to come up with a plan, basically, a great transition plan. And the essence of it is cracking open uh, new frontiers of uh, financialization, um, you can call it commodification, although again, with the caveat that uh, I do think it's worth bearing in mind always that, that capitalism is not per se the goal. Um, and basically uh, mobilizing, uh, uh, mobilizing a roadmap to turn the ecological crisis into a means for the further accumulation of wealth on the part of uh, the ruling class. So uh, this goes back to what I was laying out in terms of the, uh, they, they, so they posit a financing gap, that there's a massive gap in terms of the amount of capital that's currently mobilized versus the amount of capital that needs to be mobilized in order to achieve the kinds of emissions reductions, especially uh, in the South. Uh, but not only in the South. And so they also uh, uh, posit gaps in terms of the amount of capital that needs to be mobilized in order to preserve nature. And what, when they call it preserve nature, what they're really talking about is actually uh, turning nature into a new commodity frontier in a sense, financializing nature and turning it into a revenue stream, right? Um, it, so what, what is probably planned is to actually uh, turn the carbon emission, uh, carbon absorption capacity of, of the earth system into uh, various forms of climate bonds or otherwise, so that this capacity to pull down carbon dioxide and absorb it actually becomes something that Northern corporations, Northern financial institutions can directly profit from. And another aspect of mobilizing this massive amounts of capital, right? This is what they call the capital that's currently sitting on the sidelines or invested in low return bonds and so forth. And this is in the amount of trillions and actually Ocasio-Cortez uh, Chakrabarti, our former chief advisor was saying the same thing. The Green New Deal was about crowding in the capital that's currently on the sidelines because there's a lot of so-called idle capital and crowding it into new uh, opportunities for investment. So mobilizing that, especially into the renewables transition because, and, and basically turning these renewables, which will be guaranteed by states um, into a new revenue stream um, and also, of course, doing the same for the, the Global North, right? So this is a way of getting as much state support, in other words, the pocketbooks of working people in the North and the South, getting them to pay for putting in place the risk guarantees that then allow for the private flows of revenue and profit on the part of the ruling class, including, of course, these financial institutions will be the ones who are packaging the bonds uh, engineering the revenue streams and pocketing as much of it as possible. 
So I want to jump at least to my last piece to for folks in, into page 49. This is a chapter two about accelerationism, the, the section on acceleration moves left. Um, I want you to give us a breakdown of this, of the, of this kind of uh, dangers. And, and it, it appears it's in many different ways. You know, one of which um, had some popular currency uh, around, uh, what was the book called? Um, Fully Automated Luxury uh, Communism, right? Uh, and some of the premise around it has to deal with the whole, the techno fix, uh, eco-modernism, uh, but also a, a level of acceleration. So can you break some of that down? Because when we, one of my concerns, let me just state this for everybody and for you, Max. One of my, my biggest concerns, I think you, you put it that, you know, uh, earlier that the work is to help us understand, you know, the plans and the thinking and the maneuvers of our enemies, right, our class enemies. Uh, a lot of these ideas are also shared by sections of the left. And I think we have to figure out how to, to both interrogate that and distangle it and come up with an alternative program. But this accelerationist piece is something that we're hearing more and more of and we're seeing more and more plans and dialogues and discussions amongst the left uh, uh, that are not only creeping, but kind of running to this, to this orientation. So if you can break that down, particularly the, 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 the work um, uh, from Bastani, you know, that, that you cite there uh, and some of the dead ends that that leads to. Yeah, absolutely. So I think this is, um, this is critical. And I think that, um, I think this is in a sense, uh, stewed into the left, right? It, it, it's actually a, a more or less conscious, uh, process of ideological disorganization. Um, and, and I might actually take the, again, the, the caveat that I, I don't know, um, I don't know how much currency this type of thinking has in general, for the most part, uh, amongst people who are actually engaged leftists. Um, I actually think it's targeting a slightly different social level, but this is open for discussion. Um, cause maybe, maybe people have been checking this stuff out. I don't know, you know, I haven't done, uh, <laughs> I haven't been engaged in wide enough conversations to know who's been engaged with this and not, but it's my feeling now. Uh, so I'm going to get into that, um, in a bit, but, uh, first I want to describe, um, what this stuff is, right? So it, it's, again, it's basically this idea. Um, it, it's basically, the, it's modernization theory plus communism in the sense that it's saying, okay, uh, we do need to engage in um, some type of redistribution, but we don't need to think about what is an appropriate way to fit ourselves into the world. Instead, we can remake the world uh, so that we can live however the hell we want. Um, however the hell we want is inevitably uh, something like, you know, how the average upper middle class, uh, European or American lives. Um, in other words, uh, zero manual labor, uh, robots doing absolutely everything. Um, limitless uh, car and plane travel, uh, limitless appliances, limitless iPhones, space travel. Uh, and then it's even taken in rather more far-fetched ways into ideas like vertical farms and so forth. Uh, the replacement of meat with cellular agriculture, limitless uh, agriculture, limitless uh, energy via uh, nuclear installations that will be spread across the entire world. So every uh, every social technology, every social ecological challenge in this schema, right, um, is instead resolved with a technological fix rather than a fix that. Uh, rather than a transition that attends to social and ecological contradiction simultaneously while respecting the fact that we are uh, part of nature with a specific uh, biospheric niche that uh, could collapse upon us, right? Instead, this idea is that we can just dominate everything, right? This is, uh, this is the, the conceit. Now, 
in terms of what 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 this type of thinking does, I mean, I, uh, generally for those who it uh, for those who uh, absorb this type of thinking, I think it um, I, I think it creates an inability to combat the ruling class agenda because the ruling class agenda, right, is works through specific technologies. I mean, always, right? I mean, there's no not like the ruling class is just like picking a technology randomly, right? It designs a technology and a very specific technology in a specific way for a specific end, which is natural, right? If you need to carry out a task of class four, you're going to design a specific tool to do so. I mean, this is just common sense. Like if you want to farm, you're going to carry out, you're going to design a specific implement to farm. And if you're an individual to who, uh, who's farming, right? The same way, if you want to carry out a class board, you're going to carry out a specific, design a specific technology to carry out uh, the class board. If you want to dispossess people from farming, you're also going to say, okay, we need, uh, you know, okay, we can just mechanize everything, right? So this is, a, a, the technology is not neutral in that sense, right? And this is what we, what, what we need to be thinking in terms of, right? And what eco, uh, eco-modernism and uh, leftist acceleration or communist accelerationism is giving us a pedagogy against, like a pedagogy, a teaching, a practice of teaching of confusion is trying to convince us, trying to convince us with, that we don't need to critically evaluate a technology as it approaches. Instead, it's saying, okay, give the technology the benefit of the doubt. Um, now, instead, what I think should be done, it's not original insight, is to say, no, even if you're a leftist or whatever, justify the technology. And as soon as you ask capital, or, uh, but especially if you, if, if you ask capital to justify its technology, is it going to be able to do so? Of course not, right? So put the onus back on the introducer of the technology to justify it. And already you go a long way um, towards undermining uh, the, techno uh, the way technology is working as a mechanism of um, disorientation. Now, you know, I kind of think I have some sense of the types of people, and I mean that in a good way, who could be um, listening to, uh, to this type of conversation. Um, and so what I um, now, where, so where I differ is that I think that this eco, uh, that this uh, accelerationism um, is actually, it, it's targeting a very socially unmoored uh, kind of lumpen intelligentsia who are not politically engaged. In fact, this is at least, this is my feeling. It's targeting people who are not politically engaged and basically uh, roping them in through this kind of flashy, uh, this kind of flashy apparatus of technology to the ruling class agenda and so that they become adjuncts of the ruling class agenda, which is fascism and colonialism and imperialism and capitalism, right? And they're like, no, but we're actually leftists, we're Marxists, we're anti-imperialists, or what have you. We just happen to want to consider this technology. And it's like, okay, well then that actually, so the, the role they play is a, insofar as they're able to disseminate this type of ideology is to actually confuse the process of consolidating an opposition to the ruling class agenda, which precisely works through these technologies. And this is why we're bombarded with discussions of uh, nuclear. This is why we're bombarded with discussions of uh, cellular meat and mandatory veganism. This is why we're bombarded with discussions of uh, vertical farm. Um, and probably other people may be able to raise other uh, things that have suddenly appeared in their field of vision. This is actively being propagated by leftist publishers in our current moment. Um, why this is happening is a more complicated question with no, uh, no answer that reflects very well upon them, right? But 
this is not an accident, right? This is actually uh, this is being carried out quite purposefully and uh, maliciously. So and it's something I think we have to keep in mind, um, less because I think the people in this conversation could be embracing this type of technology necessarily, but because so we can take on the task of um, intellectual, organizational, ideological, and political self-defense, which includes spreading uh, broader awareness of what this agenda is, what this agenda is, and how to oppose it. All right, so I want to open it up. I got a ton of more questions, but I want to open it up uh, to the audience to ask questions. I'll start with one uh, that came in uh, via the chat, and folks can post questions here. And given our size, uh, if you uh, use the the hand raising feature, uh, we'll take questions uh, directly as there. But we'll start with the first one, which came up, uh, which is: Are you familiar with solar punk? Uh, which is often contrasted to eco-modernism. Uh, the Bagnani piece you opened with seems like it overlaps strongly with the movement. Uh, what do you see as the role of art? It's kind of a second question. What do you see as the role of art more broadly in creating free ecological futures? So I'm, I'm, I'm not at all familiar with, um, uh, with solar punk, although I'm, I'm, if, if whoever asked the question wants to expand upon it um, and, and how it's, uh, it's relevant, I would be very happy to hear about it because it sounds cool, especially if it overlaps with uh, this painting behind me. The, the role of art, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Philistine. Um, I love looking at art and I think movement artists produce uh, beautiful things, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I think, I think, uh, I think we should be, surrounded by um, uh, beautiful things and nice art. And uh, in fact, this is a, a big part of uh, the last couple chapters of my book is that, um, uh, you know, that our infrastructure should be part of the, uh, should be envisioned as, as a aesthetic element of the transition as well, um, rather than this kind of uh, ugly industrial modernity. But these are kind of more theoretical or ideological positions. I, I don't, I don't necessarily have a very developed position other than the fact that I think the art should serve the people, like, uh, like the like the dead comrade behind me was doing with uh, with this amazing grace. So invitation was open, uh, Max. Uh, it's Pushlaski um, to give us a brief definition of uh, solar punk if you wouldn't mind doing that. He may have stepped away, so we, we can either come back to that or go to another set of questions. So, um, <clears throat> uh, he writes in the, in the, in the Chad, solar punk is a visionary utopian politics and aesthetic that critically engages the reality of capitalist catastrophe uh, while maintaining a radical optimism about humanity's hopes for a communal ecological future. Uh, it's a restorative justice process at a planetary scale among people and between humans and non-human nature. That means reclaiming pieces of pre-capitalist culture and material accountability for old practices and radical adaptability towards new ones, all while maintaining a utopian and ecological vision for the potentialities of our interrelations in the present. Um, I would just ask, uh, ask Max uh, if you could just give us a few citations for folks to do some further uh, you know, reading and study uh, on this. Uh, I know I would appreciate I'm familiar with the term, but not many things uh, or many works within that. Uh, and that's just within the last maybe two or three years I've heard of that. Um, so a couple of other questions that have come to mind, uh, that have come up, uh, Max. So this is one from uh, David Silver Silverman. Uh, in the midst of writing a piece consistent with his critique of eco-modernism uh, and would like to review it, review this combo as I think it through uh, when does uh, ISE, the Institute for Social Ecology, expect to post this video for viewing? Uh, very soon. We'll get it up next week. 
just to answer that that question, uh, David. Um, so uh, we'll the folks can just uh, put some questions in. I have some more questions uh, that I can go with, you know, uh, until folks can kind of formulate uh, some of your own. Um, one I would want to 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 come back to. Uh, you said you didn't like the term degrowth. Um, you know, a little a bit earlier. You know, uh, break that down. Like, what is what's the opposition you have uh, with that term? I know I have some issues with some aspects of the movement, particularly European so expressions. But the term itself, uh, what's your opposition there? Uh, I mean, I appreciate the work the degrowthers are doing, and I think they've thrown a monkey wrench in um, in, in uh, a lot of the ideological propaganda uh, of capitalism. Um, so I, I guess my, my, my issues with the term uh, are twofold um, and why I don't use it. But I, again, I think multiple flowers have a right to bloom, right? I mean, one, I think it's so clear that there are sectors we wanna grow and sectors we wanna shrink. And degrowthers will tell you that. Um, but um, and in a sense, this is like a, a messaging issue. It's like they agree that there are sectors they want to grow and sectors they want to shrink. So I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm an eco-socialist and there are sectors I want to grow and I want to shrink too. Uh, maybe their messaging is more effective. I don't know. You know, uh, that's not for me to say necessarily, but that is one issue in, in that I would rather just put that out in front and say there are sectors we need to grow and there are sectors we need to shrink straight up. That's, that's part of the problem. I mean, the other problem is that, you know, the degrowthers um, are often messy when it comes to a variety of forms of diagnosis of the world system. I mean, I, I'm mostly using uh, third world Marxism, especially the work of Samir Amin, but others in the dependency tradition and uh, work on environmentally uh, uneven exchange and so forth. Um, I think this is a correct, for the most part, diagnosis. I mean, of course, it, there's lots of places to improve it, but I think this is correct as the general framework. I do not see this embraced very much uh, by the degrowthers, right? There's very, very uh, loose when it comes to a diagnosis of the nature of the world we live in. Um, and I also think the degrowthers have been uh, often but again, not always, because there's lots of different degrowthers, and some of them are good with this. But some of them are um, have no conception at all of imperialism, mm -hmm. right? They have no conception that there's a system of north south uh, south north value transfer um, that needs to be stopped. I mean, um, at best, this is kind of gestured to through various forms of uh, decolonial analysis. But I don't think. A lot of this analysis, a lot of it is trapped in uh, discourse analysis or epistemology rather than getting a material diagnosis of the world system and what it's necessary to change it. I mean, I don't think, um, I don't think deep growth has a very, any clear global south consensus around it, any significant global south consensus around it. Um, and I think these are these are issues. Uh, you know, I don't see any mass movements in the global south taking up deep growth, and some of the uh, movements that are put forward as uh, putting forth analogs to deep growth are, uh, I think, often very much propped up by uh, northern foundations that are setting a ideological agenda that is uh, suppressing kind of this north-south antagonism as, as constitutive of the world system. So. Uh, you know, again, these are this is in this type of conversation. I would have a critique of degrowth. Um, in others, I wouldn't. Um, I think they're doing a lot of good work. I think, uh, in terms of a lot of their critique, uh, they're putting forward very effective critiques of eco modernism. Sometimes some of the best critiques of eco modernism um, and of capitalist technologies, putting forward very thoughtful alternatives at the technological and planning level. They do a lot of good work. I consider them comrades, but this is, uh, I don't, uh, it's not how I prefer to frame things. Question here uh, came in uh, from HD. Um, uh, I'd love to hear more about your thoughts on how to manage or negotiate 
uh, our confidence in the constructive anti-capitalist potentials and global liberation movements and global South nation states, which have off, which have often, which often have the potential to go in a re reactionary capitalist or even worse direction, rather than representing the autonomy of the people they claim to represent. Well, you know, I think, um, I, I mean, I think if I had a really good answer to that, I would be uh, Amilcar Cabral or Mao or something <laughs> like that, you know, or, um, or uh, even Barca, and then I'd be dead, <laughs> right? I don't have an answer to that question. I absolutely don't, right? There, I have absolutely no answer to that question other than, uh, other than um, stating that, you know, I, I think analytically, um, the national question remains relevant. I mean, I think there have been deeply flawed uh, yet uh, immensely inspiring national liberation movements in the past and in the present. I mean, I think the national popular grammar with all of its many flaws, because it's politics in a human world made up by flawed human people has produced errors, if not crimes. Um, and yet I think that the national question remains uh, grammar that is being used for the redistribution of wealth and uh, is being aggressively targeted by the US, right? Um, that, the national popular uh, elements in Southeast Asia, Latin America, uh, Southern Africa, like Zimbabwe, are being heavily sanctioned, right, if not invaded, uh, if not coup, uh, subject of coup d'etat by the US. So how are we orienting to, of course, flawed forces that are carrying out material redistribution uh, in favor of their people, right? So who is, uh, you know, it's not that, it's not that I'm advocating that we don't see uh, these contradictions in these forces in the South. But what I do see is a lot of people saying, okay, these contradictions are so acute that I'm gonna reject them. And then there's ends up being a substantive alignment with, um, uh, with the imperialist agenda, right? I mean, we can see it occurring in real time. Um, and I think, that, that has to be dealt with, right? I mean, we can't ignore that that's happening. We can't just say it doesn't matter that that's what the Imperium is doing. It doesn't matter, we don't care. You know, we think these people are carrying out the right agenda. I, I just don't think, I think that's not the case. I think we have to be more rigorous about our work. And it, that doesn't mean rejecting contradictions in all these messy social processes going on in the global South. You know, of course they exist. Uh, but navigating them is different from recognizing them and where and how we recognize them and with what volume and which with, with which public spheres. These are all different things, right? I, I don't think that often have to be worked out in practice rather than just kind of a prescription from this type of talk. Well, that's the, this piece around navigating the contradictions. Um, that's a critical piece that we have to figure out in our day and time. Um, you know, the, the situation requires it. Uh, it absolutely requires it. I, I can go on why, but let, let's see another question that, uh, that just came in. Um, uh, two of them there actually. So one, uh, something you've mentioned a few times, uh, you've mentioned veganism uh, and I'm curious to think uh, uh, if there if there are any particular benefits or drawback to it, this came in from Sam. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, I have to do a self credit. Sometimes I get in, drawn into a polemical register uh, with these vegans, uh, with or not with these vegans, but the veganism discourse as it appears um, produced by some of these kind of pseudo leftist characters. Um, and the, there's no problem with with veganism. Right. I mean, in, in general, I am uh, not of the opinion that uh, shifting personal consumption practices is a major contributor to systemic change. But nevertheless, I mean, we all carry out uh, different forms of uh, consumption in ways we feel comfortable with. Um, and if folks don't want to be eating animals, that's fine. I love animals. I mean, 
Um, so I, I don't mean to polemicize against vegans, but there is a malicious capitalist platform, pseudo left vegan discourse, right? That is being platformed. And I'll just put the names right out there. Andreas Malm, so-called progressive eco-Marxist intellectual said the most salutary outcome for global diets would be global veganism, right? That is giving a warrant to the removal of meat from worldwide diets, which is the agenda of the ruling class and the documents I footnote and lay out in the first chapter of my book, right? That cannot be, and not only that, people in the global South need meat in the real world, in their current world for their uh, nutritional needs, right? They can't get, there's no alternatives very often. Right? And not only that, but a lot of them are relying on pastoralism for uh, some portion of their well-being and their income. Right? Um, it, this is especially the case in South Asia and Africa. Uh, something between 300 and 500 million people are relying on meat production for some or all of their uh, social needs. Right? So a call to do, uh, a, this, these calls for mandatory veganism, right? Um, which most actual vegans in the U.S. don't advocate, in my experience. But these calls, which are speaking in the name of Global North vegans, are calls for an immense damage to the lives of million, hundreds of millions of people in the Global South, right? And um, the entire left press is platforming this, Verso Books, uh, Jacobin. Um, and... This, uh, of course, the, the New Republic and Logic Magazine, all these little clever, uh, clever uh, boutique little leftist presses and so forth. I mean, this is what I was talking about in terms of the proliferation of um, ideological disorganization. Um, and I think, it, so it's not about um, people who don't want to eat animals at all, but it's about people who want to... Uh, are giving a, a moral uh, warrant to extend that to the global south in coercive ways, right? I think this, um, this needs to be uh, opposed before it gets further traction, and it is getting further traction, and it's going to get more and more further traction, um, uh, be precisely because I think a lot of the pastoral lands are being targeted for either some form of biofuel or forms of reforestation or afforestation, even though it's ecologically inappropriate. Um, and this will be part of the way they'll try, even though it, it doesn't make sense ecologically speaking for a variety of reasons. But this is what they're gonna try to do in order to, uh, to carbon offsets and sustain the burning of fossil fuels or sustain the airline industry in its current form into the future. So I think there's, there's consequences for uh, these calls when they enter the public sphere in certain ways. Um, but again, like, uh, <laughs> apologies if this, it comes off as uh, me against, like, people who are vegans in the U.S., like, that is not at all the problem, even remotely. And please, like, follow up with that if there's a part that uh, was, was insufficiently clear. So I think this will be... Uh... Sam says that he agrees. He thought it was thorough. <laughs> um, so I think this will be our last uh, question for uh, today. Um, uh, interventions in the Green New Deal initiative uh, as this discussion moves forward, right? They expect that we'll, we'll be covering that and for sure we will. Uh, but in the midst of the Build Back Better legislation and anticipated massive funding, the temptation, perhaps necessity, to engage in debating the machinery of the programs to be funded would also be coupled with getting absorbed into, hired by the process of implementation. Uh, what are best examples and ways forward to avoid co-optation uh, as best we can and where possible turn such programs on their head to strengthen movements and heighten contradictions effectively through this process as actors with some traction, uh, perhaps, folks, uh, and captions in these systems. So, good question, and because uh, this that's, this is a real world piece of, that we see happening in real time. Um, 
you know, just to answer some of that, a lot of this is is uh, already being uh, discussed within uh, a number of major uh, alliances and formations within the United States, uh, from uh, the rising majority to uh, most of the big greens are deeply embedded uh, in, uh, in trying to uh, get some piece or move some aspect of um, the Green New Deal and the Build Back Better. Uh, and this question to this point in, in a lot of respects is being avoided. So your thoughts on that, uh, Max? And now I have to be not Cabral, but Lenin. Um, you know, I, I really don't know. I mean, I think, uh, I don't know. I think, you know, I think we're pathologically disorganized in the U.S., myself included, for sure. Um, and I think, you know, entering... Um, this type of work on a freelance individual basis is extremely hard to resist the structural forces towards, uh, towards co-optation. I mean, I think, um, I think it's clear, you know, and I don't really have an answer to that outside of uh, organizations that have uh, independent points of unity that are able to maintain uh, independent, um, you know, organizational orientation outside of it. I mean, I think, um, you know, uh, Maybe you want to do one of these with uh, Ahed Ahmed you know, from Drum. He has some more intelligent thoughts coming from actual experience trying to do it. Um, but I, you know, honestly, I don't. I, I have to take a, I have to take a pass on that because I don't know. Well, I'll, I'll offer a few things just for the conversation. You know, in in uh, with my other hat in cooperation, Jackson, we're deeply involved in these debates uh, and trying to move them. Uh, to the greatest extent possible to the left. And one of the things that we have been uh, deeply embroiled in, uh, I think often uh, harshly criticized for and, and, and even excluded from many of the tables where some of these debates are you know, being had right now or the discussions that are being had more so than debates um, is really questioning uh, just based upon a real world analysis to what extent given the 50-50 the, the split in effect in, in the Senate, uh, do people really think that there's going to be any massive implementation uh, of anything resembling the Build Back Better, let alone the Green New Deal? Um, and they're trying to say to the extent that there is you know, really record number, a record level of uh, philanthropic investment uh, in the, the social movement, uh, within the United States geared towards uh, lobbying and policy implementation. You know, our practical way of trying to deal with that is say, hey, that, that this, to the extent that our movement is going to engage it, and we know large sectors at this point have to, uh, just given the nature of how their uh, folks are embedded within nonprofit structures, um, nonprofit organizations to, to do what, you know, their, their organizing work, uh, that instead of focusing in, particularly like in an area like in the Deep South, instead of focusing in on trying to uh, uh, pass legislation, which is going to go nowhere in those state legislatures, uh, build uh, uh, and invest, I'm gonna use that word very clearly uh, and intentionally here in this discussion, invest that in building autonomous infrastructure within the community uh, to build our own capacity uh, and to build our own infrastructure. Um, that money will be much better spent and strategically much better spent uh, if that was the orientation of the movement in making that demand uh, on capital and philanthropic capital is capital to making that demand on capital uh, to reorient its or orientation to build actual power. But there again is the rub. Uh, you know, philanthropic capital understands um, providing leverage to folks to, to act independently of it. Uh, uh, and is not particularly interested in making investments of that of that nature. Uh, and what I'm talking about, you know, the, the, despite the many contradictions, but this, you know, make it on a practical level, you know, creating community solar, you know, doing more to, to buy land so that uh, more groups can do, you know, uh, uh, farming uh, and do independent kind of production to rearticulate uh, the means of production and shift some aspects of the economy. Like these are some practical things that can be done in the United States and can be done under current uh, conditions uh, that would leave a long-term register with organizing, right? With very clear 
uh, uh, people in class conscious organizing could change the register. And therein, I think, is you know where where the conflict lies in building an independent, uh, autonomous you know uh, uh, kind of infrastructure as opposed to uh, being a tag along uh, to what the corporations want to do. Uh, and we have to be clear, and we have to call these things out. And that's just one basic way of how do we fight co-optation or some elements of the co-optation. Uh, you're not going to do it without some level of being clear and conscious of who our class enemies are and, and what we need to build, you know, and what we need to fight. So let me see if there's any other uh, questions. So uh, I want to thank everybody just that we're in this here now. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. We will be picking uh, this conversation up again uh, next Friday on the 22nd. Uh, at the same time, uh, and we'll be going through uh, chapters three through six. I would definitely want to encourage everyone to read. Uh, today was much kind of more of a general uh, overview with the time permitted, but the next one we will get into some more meat and bones uh, of some critical pieces within the work. So please, uh, you know, get your hands on it uh, and get to reading and join us uh, next Friday. Max, I want to thank you for your time. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your candid uh, uh, responses and your honesty about you know, uh, what you can do and what you can't. We need more of that uh, uh, within our movement right now. Uh, and appreciate all of you for uh, tuning in, spread the word uh, to others. I think this is one of the more critical conversations of our time uh, that mixes both practical application you know, with the theoretical and ideological clarity that we need to struggle uh, to attain. So uh, I can just uh, say one thing um, for the, for those who are who are planning on coming in uh, two weeks. Um, the other reason I urge you to re uh, check out the book, and again, it's not so, not to get you a buy, you get that, get it for free online, um, is because otherwise that way I can actually answer and explain things rather than maybe just saying stuff you already understood perfectly. You know, so uh, rather than things that were not clear from the book. So uh, it, it gives me the opportunity to be more helpful and to and use the time more effectively. Let's do it, let's do it. All right, appreciate everybody. Next Friday, take care.